The United States of America is not exactly a small country. And the landmass it sits on hasn't exactly been around for a short amount of time. Think of the millions and millions of years that life has been around on our planet. Fossil sponges, for example, have been found elsewhere on the North American continent, which date back to around 890 million years ago. In that time, the United States had been home to a plethora of bizarre creatures, both famous and familiar, and some of which are alien and unrecognizable. Today, we will take you on a journey through the natural history of this vast and ancient land, from the shallow waters of the Cambrian, right through to the icy forests of the Pleistocene. On the way, we'll meet the outlandish and extravagant wildlife that once called America home, such as the infamous dinosaurs of the Cretaceous period and the bizarre beasts of the Permian. Join us as we take a voyage spanning over 500 million years, as we discover the prehistoric creatures of the United States of America. Around 500 million years ago, life on land the world over was impossible. Plants had not evolved, meaning there was no oxygen on land for terrestrial animals to breathe. Underwater, however, it was a very different story. In what would one day become the United States of America, a landmass which at the time was known as Laurentia, life was large from the get-go. Huge masses of trilobites, small crustacean-like animals, filter-fed on the plankton and microorganisms on the shallow sea floor, which represented a huge proportion of animal life up until this point. The trilobites weren't alone, however. Something had evolved to feed on them. Anomalocaris fossils have been found in both Canada and the United States, and represent the world's first apex predator. The translation of its name to English, abnormal shrimp, should give you a good idea of the creature's appearance. Ranging in size from around half a meter to a meter in length, this relatively large radio dot drifted above the seafloor on wing-like structures projecting from each flank. Complex eyes scoured the seafloor in search of prey, while grasping appendages protruding from the front of the head carefully lifted their armored trilobite prey into their grinding mouth below. It was these innovations, in evolutionary beginnings, that set the stage for the faunas and floras of the USA to come. What followed from the Cambrian was the Ore Division period. It saw both its invertebrate and early vertebrate life continue to remain largely in shallow seas only growing to extensive and outlandish proportions in the process. Laurentia was now situated pretty much on the equator, and the landmass was growing. Beneath the waves, some of the first prehistoric sea monsters were beginning to evolve. Camaroceras was a huge orthocone, a shelled cephalopod related to modern squid and octopodes. Estimated to grow to around 7.5 meters from the tip of its shell to the tip of its tentacles, this giant would have hunted in a similar manner to Anomalocaris, using its tentacles to bring hard-shelled invertebrates into its beaked mouth concealed within. As well as many species of diversifying trilobite, Camaroceras shared these waters with Megalograptus, a species of Eurypterid, or sea scorpion. Roughly half as long as an adult man is tall, these creatures sported impressive pincer-like appendages, covered in bristles and spines, projecting from the front of the head. It likely fed on smaller invertebrates and early fishes, as it paddled itself through the water on adapted limbs and a powerful, pushing tail. Complex animal life was well underway in the American Silurian beginning around 443 million years ago. 
Although still an island continent, the east coast of what would become the United States was, by this time, being lifted well above sea level, and the first plants were beginning to grow on land. This, in turn, allowed various early invertebrates to exploit their new food source, and the first animal life was beginning to escape the confines of the waves. Life was still alive and kicking in the water, however, evident in creatures like the Loro Climatius, a very early species of shark, which only measured around 7 centimeters in length. Unlike many modern-day species of shark, Climatius would have hunted even smaller crustaceans, supplementing its diet with fish, which it likely hunted down using its great eyesight and small, sharp teeth. The Devonian period, otherwise known as the Age of Fishes, saw another famous face arrive on the American scene, Dunkleosteus. This giant fish, measuring over 8 meters from tail tip to snout, was a huge carnivorous placoderm, or armored fish, with huge shear-like teeth used for tearing through the armor of ammonites or other placoderms. Studies show that young Dunkleosteus were as well adapted to this as adults were, meaning that, at a very early age, these apex predators were able to tear through shell and carapace with a similarly powerful bite force. Due to its large size and heavily armored nature of its anatomy, these fishes would have been slow swimmers, occasionally capable of powerful bursts of energy to catch up with prey. Dunkleosteus was one of America's first giant carnivores, a true tiger shark of its day. Hyneria was another large predator of the fish world in Devonian America, an inhabitant of the freshwater waterways, lakes, and swamps that covered much of the land throughout this time. Hyneria was a predator of large semi-aquatic amphibians, such as Hynerpeton, which it pursued with an incredibly powerful tail. Equally powerful lobed fins may have allowed it to pull itself out of the water temporarily to catch its prey, which, unlike Hyneria, were not bound to the water's edge. Fishes weren't the only super predators in the American Devonian, however. The Eurypterids had, by this point, grown to reach their zenith. J. Coleopterus was not only the largest Eurypterid, but the largest arthropod ever discovered. Sharing a wider body plan with Megalograptus of the Ore Division, J. Coleopterus was two and a half meters long and its foremost appendages had now evolved into sharp, grasping pincers, designed for tearing and slicing at prey. To compensate for its giant size, it is likely that J. Coleopterus was very lightweight, but its size may have aided it in choosing a mate, breathing, or molting its carapace. While elsewhere in the world, the Carboniferous period is synonymous with giant arthropods. Over in America, it was the fish's time to shine. America's true age of the fishes had now arrived, around 359 million years ago, as North America began to collide with Gondwana, a supercontinent comprising parts of Africa, Asia, Oceania, and Antarctica. As the collision took place, the Rocky Mountains were formed, while a shallow sea began to take hold over much of what would become America's low-lying land. In that shallow sea, some of the strangest cartilaginous fish, the group we associate with modern sharks and rays, were evolving. Creatures such as Balancey, a small fish, whilst related to sharks, more closely resembled an anglerfish, with its broad, fan-like fins and adaptations to a frogfish-like, almost sedentary lifestyle amongst the seafloor's rocks and stones. Elsewhere swam the likes of Harpago Futator, an eel-like, scaleless cartilaginous fish about 20 centimeters in length. What makes this fish especially bizarre is the fact that it possessed antler-like structures atop its head. 
only males on these structures, leading scientists to believe that they may have either aided in display or as a support structure for mating. More well-known cartilaginous fish inhabited the shallow Carboniferous Sea, however, in the form of Edestus, known primarily for fossils of curved blade-like teeth, or whorls. Judging from the size of these whorls, we can estimate that Edestus may have reached over 6 meters in length, patrolling the seas as an apex predator, as it used its blade-ridden mouth to slice up other fish. Elsewhere, in the Carboniferous of America, amphibians were taking on strange new shapes and forms. Ophid Erpitan was a small, limbless, snake-like swamp dweller, whilst Rear Erpitan may have grown to about one and a half meters in length, similar in form to a modern crocodile. The massive time period that we call the Paleozoic came to an end with the Permian period. By this time, the continents had merged together to form Pangaea, a supercontinent 148 million square kilometers across. The end of the Paleozoic was indeed catastrophic. Volcanic activity across the world led to the Great Dying, the worst extinction event Earth has ever seen which caused the loss of around 90% of all of Earth's species of animal and plant. Life still gave one last hurrah this time, however, presenting the planet with some of the most ingenious and iconic forms yet. You will likely all recognize Dimetrodon, a very famous lizard-like animal with a sailed back, often mistaken for a dinosaur. Dimetrodon, an inhabitant of Permian America, was in fact a stem mammal, or synapsid, a group of animals that would eventually, millions of years later, give rise to us humans. The Permian was full of synapsids, and America was no stranger to them at the time. Dimetrodon would likely have hunted a Daphosaurus, a large herbivorous relative and lookalike. It is thought that these creatures may have used the large sails on their backs to regulate their body temperatures, indicating a cold-blooded lifestyle. Stranger still was the synapsid Cotylorhynchus, which featured a huge barrel-shaped body, at the top of which sat a comically tiny head. In life, it would have looked like a huge shell-less tortoise, which was perhaps even semi-aquatic. Elsewhere in the water, other familiar faces were evolving. The ocean saw the advent of Helicoprion, another, more famous world-toothed shark, with a sharp wheel of teeth projecting from its lower jaw. Contrary to famous depictions, it is likely that this wheel of teeth was a lot more modest than the jagged, protruding spirals it was first pictured with. The freshwater wetlands of the American Permian landscape were home to Diplocolis, an amphibian with a broad, boomerang-shaped skull that would have given the creature a wide, flat form, cutting through the water with minimal resistance as its paddle-like tail propelled it along. After the great dying, the age of dinosaurs, the Mesozoic, was well and truly upon us, but not instantly. The dinosaurs only appeared towards the end of the Triassic period, and for a long time prior to that, other reptiles ruled the roost. By the Triassic, which began 251 million years ago, North America was situated on the far west of Pangaea, clinging to what would one day become the continents of South America and Africa, what would one day become the United States was still half covered by the giant Panthalassic Ocean, which, towards the end of the period, supported a very special creature indeed, Shonisaurus. Shonisaurus was a true giant. At 15 meters in length, this gigantic ichthyosaur patrolled the oceans, perhaps in pods or groups, searching for food. As large as it was, 
Shonisaurus wasn't even the largest ichthyosaur. Another inhabitant of the Triassic Panthalassic was Shastasaurus, measuring a truly gigantic 21 meters in length. These creatures were the very largest animals Earth had seen at the time, and would still have millions of years to wait before anything larger took that title. On land, the reptiles had diversified into many amazing forms. Drapanosaurus took up a sloth-like lifestyle amongst the trees, using its long, powerful tail to grip the branches. Smilosuchus, a 12-meter-long phytosaur, patrolled the wetlands, crocodile-like in appearance. Arizonasaurus, a quadrupedal apex predator, which resembled earlier depictions of Spinosaurus, stalked the deserts. The reptiles had conquered the globe, and the Mesozoic was in full swing. As significant as these finds are, we remember the Triassic more closely for bringing about the age of the dinosaurs, and what would one day become the United States of America had its fair share. Starting small and modest, little theropods like Coelophysis, Camposaurus, and Daemonosaurus swiftly ran in small groups through the floodplains and wetlands of the would-be United States, picking off lizards, fish, and invertebrates as they went. These were incredibly small and humble beginnings when you take into consideration where evolution took the dinosaurs in the following Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. By the Jurassic period, which lasted from around 201 million years ago to 145 million years ago, it was most famously the time of extremely large dinosaurs, the mighty sauropods. Some of the most famous of all lived in what is now America throughout the Jurassic. Brachiosaurus and Camarasaurus towered high above the creatures which fed at ground level, while they stripped branches bare with large teeth designed for scraping and chewing. Brachiosaurus was a particularly tall species, with its neck held vertically in the air, measuring up to 26 meters long and 15 meters tall. Its forelegs were much longer than its hind legs, which is what gives this titan its name, which translates to English as arm lizard. Creatures as large as sauropods risked a potentially deadly threat from the warm climate of the Jurassic, overheating. To combat this, Brachiosaurus's body were filled with air sacs, which kept the animal cool on particularly warm days. This ingenious adaptation would also have let the giant dinosaur reduce its calorie intake, meaning that it didn't need to spend as much time feeding. The world-famous Diplodocus was also present throughout the American Jurassic. A sauropod which was famously very different than Brachiosaurus, this creature favored a much more horizontal stance, supporting itself in the middle of its 24 meter length with four pillar-like legs, as the neck stretched out far in front and the tail stretched out even further behind as a counterbalance. Much shorter in height than the likes of Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus favored the lower growing vegetation, and thus evolved accordingly to exploit it. The tail was the dinosaur's main form of defense against the large American theropods of the region, which it would swing back and forth as a whip-like mechanism, which could easily debilitate or even kill a would-be attacker. Like many other sauropods, Diplodocus hatchlings, or sauropodlets, were tiny immediately after hatching measuring only around one meter in length. As such, the eggs were laid in nests which were hidden away in the dense forests, providing effective cover for these little creatures as they grew and developed. The forests were full of swift predators, such as Ornitholestes and Dilophosaurus, which would have been able to make an easy meal of the babies. As the dinosaurs grew, they would leave the forests to join the vast herds on the open plains, where they faced a different kind of threat. 
This threat came in the form of the infamous Allosaurus, lovingly referred to as the Lion of the Jurassic, due to its pack-hunting nature. Groups of these large theropods would congregate on the open plains to prey on the sick, old, or young Diplodocus, leaping and slashing at the herds with sharp claws on their forelimbs and hindlimbs, as well as large, snapping jaws. There wasn't much in Jurassic America that Allosaurus wouldn't hunt. Its meals will have likely included herbivores, both large and small, as well as other theropods, on top of its sauropod diet. Allosaurus was, however, rather weak for such a large theropod, and paleontologists have put forward the theory that the large dinosaur was instead a scavenger, almost like a gigantic reptilian vulture. Another dinosaur native to the Jurassic of the United States of America was the popular superstar, Stegosaurus, as well as being armed with four long, sharp tail spikes known as Thagomizers. Stegosaurus was famously the proud owner of spectacular bony spinal plates, which ran from the dinosaur's shoulders right down to the base of the tail. These plates have been the topic of much scientific debate over the years, over what specifically the dinosaur used them for. The running theory is that Stegosaurus used its plates like the Dimetrodon of the Permian as a means of regulating its body temperature at warm periods. But other theories include that they served as a means of display or communication to other members of the species, indicating that the individual using them was either interested in mating or a rival member of the same sex not to be messed with. The latter was also most likely used to ward off attacks from creatures such as the larger predators, like Allosaurus or Tarvosaurus. America was, at the time, also home to a number of smaller herbivores that picked off vegetation within the forested regions of the area, such as Dryosaurus, Othnelia, and Frutidens. The Jurassic of what would one day become the USA is a fantastic example of the diversification of dinosaurs. It's staggering to think that all of these creatures were distantly related from the massive sauropods to the tiny foragers. Think of five dinosaurs in your head right now. Go. Were any of your dinosaurs Tyrannosaurus? Triceratops? Ankylosaurus even? What about Parasaurolophus? America was lucky enough to host every single one in the Cretaceous. For the landmass that would one day become the United States, the Cretaceous period was the closest it got to the true golden age of paleontology. Many of the most famous dinosaurs hail from this time, a time when the North American continent, as we know it today, was beginning to take shape. At the time, the continent was split in two. We had Laramidia in the west and Appalachia in the east. Through the middle ran the Western Interior Seaway, a huge sea which cut right through from the north to the south, pretty much right down the middle. Many, many species of dinosaur called this area home throughout the Cretaceous period. And as we mentioned before, one of these dinosaurs was Tyrannosaurus, undoubtedly the most famous dinosaur to ever walk the earth, averaging an impressive 12 meters in length. Tyrannosaurus was a huge apex predator of Cretaceous America, hunting armored tanks such as Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, as well as the patchy Cephalosaurus, Hadrosaurus, and indeed other theropods that would have cohabited the same region with it. Some of these dinosaurs, mainly Ankylosaurus, would have been a massive challenge for Tyrannosaurus to tackle. Due to the sheer level of defense and offense, these reptiles leveled against attackers. The heavy club tail of Ankylosaurus could easily have broken a bone, which could have put a predator even as large as Tyrannosaurus down for good. Triceratops also would have provided a difficult meal. With bull males growing around 8 meters long, 
and wielding impressive horns on its face. A close relative of Tyrannosaurus has shed some light on the extent of diversification within the Tyrannosaur family too. Nanoxaurus was a close relative of our famous friend, but fossils have been found in Alaska, much farther north. Alaska at the time would have been substantially colder than the rest of the United States. As a result, it was likely that the dinosaur would have had a covering of feathers or filaments to help warm it up in the face of cold winds and snow. Elsewhere throughout the American Cretaceous, the theropods were diversifying into new and unseen forms. Utah Raptor, for example, was a dromaeosaur, a relative of the very famous Velociraptor, only around 6 meters long. This is much more in line with the size of Velociraptors inaccurately portrayed in Jurassic Park. Sharing the sickle-shaped claw with its cousin on its hind limbs, Utah Raptor would potentially have lived in packs, collaborating to bring down hadrosaurs, or even small sauropods for food. Deep within the wooded areas of America at the time, lived a much stranger theropod, Nothronychus. This was a relative of Therizinosaurus, a strange herbivorous theropod with long slashing claws that we have covered before on this channel. With its tall bipedal stance and long neck, Nothronychus would have been able to reach vegetation to browse above the ground level, pulling leaves into its mouth with its specialized claws. As amazing as the dinosaurs of the American Cretaceous were, they were just one piece of a much, much bigger picture. The planet was also playing host to a number of weird and wonderful reptiles throughout the time period. Most famously, the pterosaurs had become a well-established group by the Cretaceous, and America was home to some popular favorites. The world-famous Pteranodon, the strange crested Nyctosaurus, and the mighty Quetzalcoatlus were amongst the creatures that filled these skies. Everywhere you looked, life was branching out into some of the most bizarre forms Earth had ever seen, or has seen since. This was extremely evident in the Western Interior Seaway, where the Mosasaurs, another incredibly famous group of reptiles, had begun to swim. Truly terrifying creatures, such as Tylosaurus, were among the many dangerous creatures lurking in the seas. A marine reptile, closely related to modern snakes, which could grow to around 13 meters in length. These immense reptiles weren't the only startling creatures to be found in the seaway, not by any means. Alongside the Mosasaurs swam Archelon, a species of ancient sea turtle bigger than a car. Despite its colossal appearance, Archelon's shell would have been surprisingly lightweight, consisting of a thin, bony carapace made by the ribs. On the seaway's banks lived huge colonies of Hesperornis, a seabird similar in size and shape to a large penguin, with a much more slender figure and a long, snapping beak, which would have aided it in catching the many species of fish native to the western interior seaway. It needed to be careful, however, as one of these fish, Zephactinus, was six meters in length, armed with a series of long, needle-like teeth the length of a human hand. This fish would have been more than capable of snatching an unfortunate Hesperornis from the waters with great power and even greater speed. The Cretaceous was brought to an abrupt end 66 million years ago, when the most famous of the five mass extinction events suffered by our planet took place. Many theories exist, but the most famous is that a huge asteroid plowed into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula with more force than millions of atomic bombs. The dinosaurs that hadn't already evolved into birds were obliterated, and life was forced to start anew, as humble and small as it once was. The warm forests of the tertiary period eventually took over, where the mammals, once small, shrew-like creatures living in the shadows of the reptiles, began to stake their claim on the planet. 
life was on its path to taking a similar form to the one it takes today. And many uncannily similar creatures shared the American landmass at the time. The tertiary started with the Paleocene Epoch, a period of time that saw creatures such as Barry Lambda, an animal known as a pantodont, similar in shape but completely unrelated to, the giant ground sloths that would take over the land millions of years later. Elsewhere in these forests live Cetacotherium, a creature resembling something halfway between a rat and a dog, with long, gnashing teeth. The Paleocene eventually gave way to the Eocene, where life began to grow larger once again. Large, bulky herbivores, such as Euentertherium, which resembled a large rhino with strange bulbous horns on their snouts, grazed across the woodlands and plains. Elsewhere, stranger creatures were evolving. Stylinodon was as large as a jaguar, but looked much more like a wild boar, with a long tail and huge, bulging teeth for chewing on roots and tubers. While Metachiromus was an early, long-snouted mammal, taking on a similar form to a modern giant anteater. In the seas, the first whales were beginning to evolve, and fossils of the giant cetacean Basilosaurus have actually been found in U.S. soil. At 18 meters in length, this was by far the largest mammal yet to evolve. Very big, even by prehistoric standards. The following Oligocene epoch was the tertiary period's last act, and saw the arrival of some of the first large mammalian carnivores on the scene. Hoplophonius was built much like a modern leopard, whereas species of Hyenodon, a powerful species of mammal with no surviving modern relatives, was present in America too. Perhaps the most iconic of the American Oligocene was Deodon, otherwise known as the Hell Pig. This was a two meter tall hoofed mammal, similar in appearance to a modern pig with long, crushing jaws suited to eating both vegetation and flesh. It is theorized that this creature would have likely used these jaws mainly for fighting with rivals, and that Deodon was instead a scavenger. It is even a possibility that these animals actively tracked other carnivores, just to overpower them and steal their would-be food. By the end of the Oligocene, the mammalian dynasty was well and truly in power. Mammals had cornered every part of the globe, much like their dinosaur forebears, and America was surely home to some of the most spectacular. If the American tertiary was spectacular, then the Quaternary was most definitely a sight to behold, even for the most experienced of paleontologists. Life's most recent innovations were starting to evolve by the Quaternary period, and many animals present in what would eventually become the USA were recognizable today. There were, of course, some very important distances. The Quaternary began with the Miocene Epoch, a time characterized by vast grasslands and forests that were swallowing up North America. Large and oppressive creatures had evolved to exploit the species of grasses that were on the rise throughout the Cenozoic, and other animals had in turn evolved to prey on them. A time traveler to the Miocene grasslands of America might have been met with the spectacular sight of a browsing herd of Meropis, an animal from a group known as the Calicotheres, which resembled something between a large horse and a giraffe. Unlike other Calicotheres, which evolved to walk on their knuckles, Meropis opted to walk flat on its feet, with large claws projecting out from the front hands. This would have allowed the creature to grow larger than most Calicotheres, and these beasts thrived in the open grasslands of their time as a result. The Miocene grasslands of America were also populated by animals such as Synthetoceras, a hooved animal similar in appearance to a modern antelope, only sporting a huge two-pronged stalk-like horn on the tip of its nose. A.P. Camelus was also present here, 
a tall, slender relative of modern-day camels, the size of a giraffe. Towards the coastline, carnivores were blossoming into all sorts of new shapes and sizes. Shapes such as Pontolus, for example, a very large species of early walrus, which lacked tusks. It would have been a common but imposing sight on the rocky shores of the Pacific coastline 10 million years ago, as it hauled itself onto land, uttering a long, deep, bellowing cry. The Miocene was succeeded by the Pliocene, which lasted from around 5.3 to 2.5 million years ago, a relatively short piece of the geological timescale. Fossils of large marine mammals are commonplace from the Pliocene, and America had one of its own, Semirostrum, a species of cetacean with a large projecting lower jaw, perhaps used for sifting through the seafloor sediment for food hidden within. On land, however, one of the present day's most popular groups of animals was evolving, the elephants. Gomphotherium was an American species from the Pliocene, bearing an uncanny resemblance to its modern successors. It was still very large, around three meters in height, but sported a very long lower jaw, from which sprouted highly specialized teeth for raking through the earth, allowing the animal to dig up roots for food. It still possessed long tusks, but these were downward curving, and an early trunk was evolving too, which would have given the creature a high degree of dexterity for handling food. Our final stop on this tour of the Quaternary is the Pleistocene, the time period most closely associated with woolly mammoths, the Ice Age, in the arrival of modern humans. Mammoths did exist in America in the Pleistocene, but it might be more appropriate for us to talk about the mastodons, forest-dwelling proboscidean species a bit smaller than the mammoths, with flat, sloping heads. They were endemic to the New World, and while the mammoths enjoyed an existence all over the Northern Hemisphere, America can proudly claim the mastodons as something a little more exclusive. The Pleistocene was known for its megafauna, that is, much larger versions of modern-day animals. Some of these were very famous indeed. A species of Smilodon, the most well-known of saber-toothed cats, inhabited America throughout the Pleistocene, which surely would have posed a terrifying threat to our early ancestors. Arctodus, the huge short-faced bear, was present in the United States toward the latter half of the Pleistocene too, one of the most majestic and awe-inspiring creatures that have ever called this continent home. It wasn't just the mammals that owned America this time though. The dinosaurs were back in the form of Titanus, an extremely tall species of predatory flightless terror bird, which was able to cross over to North America from South America, where its kind was initially much more abundant. These huge birds would have stalked the grasslands of their day, preying on mammals both large and small. We can't make a documentary on the natural history of America before making one final stop though. Perhaps one of the most outlandish and awesome creatures of all time made its home in what would one day become the USA. Megalonyx. The Jefferson's ground sloth was a prominent American species in the Pleistocene. Dwarfing its modern relatives, these creatures were huge browsing mammals with scarily long claws that would have been used both to aid in pulling down branches and also to slash at would-be attackers. So there we have it, a brief natural history of the United States of America, covering the largest, smallest, earliest, latest, most iconic, and most otherworldly species it had to offer. It's a massive shame that some of these creatures don't continue to exist in America today, but the fossils and signs surrounding them has provided us an amazing insight into how these creatures may have looked and lived, which is something we can all be grateful for. We can also take the time to notice the nature in our world today and reflect upon where it has come from. 
to our viewers in the USA watching this video. Just think, the next time you look out your window and see a bird, you are looking at a lineage that you can trace back to the theropod dinosaurs of the Mesozoic. The Utah Raptors, Tyrannosauruses, and Allosauruses that once roamed this land are only a stone's throw in evolutionary terms. From the Cardinals, Blue Jays, and Sparrows you may see on a daily basis.